regards. Uh, we're very pleased to uh, welcome uh, to the center as a participant in this series uh, Matthew Levitt, who's the director of the Stein Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, he's the author of a recent study, uh, The Money Trail, co-author uh, with Michael Jacobson of, of a recent study, The Money Trail, Finding, Following, and Freezing Terrorist Finances. Uh, the topic uh, could not be more timely, and uh, uh, Matt Levitt brings to it uh, the perspective both of a policy practitioner and also a policy and a, an an analyst um, currently based, as I mentioned, at the Washington Institute um, uh, for Near East Policy. He's also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, from 2005 to 2007, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and an an Analysis at uh, the, the Treasury Department. And in that capacity, he served um, both as a senior official within the Department's Terrorism and Financial Intelligence Branch and as a Deputy Chief of the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, which is one of the 16 U.S. intelligence agencies coordinated under the Office of the Director of National uh, Intelligence. Uh, during his tenure at Treasury, he played a central role in efforts to protect the United States, the U.S. financial system from abuse uh, and to deny terrorists, weapons proliferators, and other rogue actors the ability to finance threats to U.S. national security. Um, that practical experience feeds into the uh, policy study that he's just published, uh, copies of which are available at the Washington Institute uh, website uh, as a downloadable PDF. His talk today um, really springs from the uh, from that study and, and extends the analysis. Uh, w w he will uh, open up for uh, his initial presentation, then, then we'll open the floor to uh, comments and questions from the floor. So with that, Matt, the floor is yours. Pleasure to welcome you to the center. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to share some ideas with you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to speak specifically on the monograph, as you said. Uh, I'll leave it to you to uh, read and enjoy and, ju and judge. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is uh, kind of jump a little 40,000 foot. Uh, and based on my time doing this in government and analyzing it out of government, try and share what is the perspective, what's the whole strategy here uh, in terms of uh, following the money. Um, is it effective? Um, will, is it likely to be something that the incoming administration is going to continue or improve upon, um, and why? I want to give a call out uh, to my co-author and colleague Mike Jacobson, uh, without whom this research would not have been possible. Um, and you have up here the uh, full link uh, to the website, washingtoninstitute.org, if you want to download it. When I think about uh, combating terror finance, I think of it as one of several tools in a counterterrorism toolkit. You hear U.S. officials belatedly, I believe, but appropriately now and for about the past year, talking about employing and deploying an all elements of national power strategy to deal with counterterrorism and really to deal with other national security threats too. And that's uh, fantastic. Combating terror finance is one of those tools. It will not always be the best tool. It certainly will not always be, in fact, it will rarely be the best tool to use alone. The whole point of an all elements of national power strategy is that you, you, you use multiple uh, tools uh, in concert, and they uh, in concert can do what none can do uh, alone. And when you think about these tools, I find it useful to think about it in terms of combating adversary networks. <clears throat> Uh, which is really a better way, I think, of describing the nature of the threat we have today than kind of the threat we faced, say, after World War II. And so we're dealing with not only operational cells, but recruiters and ideologues, logistical and financial supporters, and we need to think about how to combat these adversary networks at each and, augur and, and several other layers uh, of this, of this uh, onion. When it comes to terror finance issues, we can have a disruptive effect, we can have a preventative effect, and we can certainly use it as a platform for collecting intelligence. This really breaks down to the two, in some ways discrepant and sometimes conflicting, uh, purposes of dealing with terror finance. One is uh, disrupting the flow of funds to, within, and among terrorist groups or other uh, adversary networks. That can be very effective, 
but it's not the only tool. The second tool, the one that you won't hear about as much in the public domain, which I'd argue is a good thing if it's working well, is financial intelligence or FININT. If you want to be respected in the intelligence community, you have to develop your own INT, and it is now FININT. FININT is extremely effective in identifying networks, relationships, the relationships between among operatives and supporters, and the nature of the threat we face today suggests that that is something that is particularly important, and so I'll start with that, with the use of, of terror finance following the money as opposed to freezing the money as a means of collecting intelligence against a very difficult target. You know, there was a time when uh, the nature of the terrorist groups we were facing was fairly hierarchical, and therefore you could, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, strike at one key point in the chain and uh, the cell or the group would collapse. Perhaps the best example is the mid to late 1990s Turkish assault on Turkish Hezbollah, a Sunni group which unfortunately is now resurgent again, but at the time was completely eradicated because of police uh, and intelligence efforts uh, at the right point in a hierarchical structure. Unfortunately, uh, as we'll see is the case with terror finance as well, our adversaries are evolutionary and fast learners and uh, Turkish Hezbollah learned its lesson and regrouped. Today we're dealing with a very, very different type of a threat, and you can call it a nodal structure or a system of systems. The bottom line is going from this 2D model to this more complicated set of relationships, and each one of these colors represents a different type of uh, activity that our adversaries need to engage in, finance, support operations, command and control, Understanding these relationships, identifying these relationships between actors that often have some type of role in the overt world and are doing what they're doing for our adversaries in a covert nature is the most important thing in uh, a successful kind of terrorism strategy. And to that end, we have three main tools. We have communications, we have travel, and we have finance. And one of the great things about finance, one of many, is that to a certain level, it doesn't lie. Any of you have had any experience with intelligence and, frankly, any other type of research in the open domain, it's true too, you need to vet your sources. Just because it says something doesn't mean it's actually true. In the case of intelligence, Saddam Hussein may be overheard talking about deploying chemical weapons to the front, which may be deception, or it may be what you're hearing on the phone is what someone actually thinks, but they're wrong. You still need to vet the information. When it comes to a transaction, however, with very, very rare exception, a transaction happens or it doesn't, and it's very easy to determine if, in fact, it's a false flag. Now, you don't necessarily know where it came from or where it's going or what it's intended for, but even starting with that very basic premise of pre-vetted information is a huge, huge start. We're dealing also with ad hoc relationships. Don't expect to find memorandum of understanding between operatives and cells and groups. I'm reminded of a colleague who was uh, researching Hezbollah and went to interview people in Beirut, and in walks a guy, a young guy wearing jeans and a Yankees hat. Now, I'm a fire-breathing, frothing-at-the-mouth Red Sox fan, so I could have told you the guy was a terrorist right then and there. <laughs> But uh, my colleague apparently had a look in his face of shock because the guy opened up his mouth with a perfectly American accent in English. And the guy said, what did you expect? I've gone to, went to school in the United States. I've been all over the place. What were you expecting me to carry a Hezbollah membership card in my wallet? No membership cards. No memorandums of understanding. Ad hoc relationships are the critical definition of the relationships between our adversaries today. They used to be once upon a time based on the same way you have relationships with people with whom you went to graduate school. Uh, there are people who went to graduates of the various training camps. We've moved beyond that a little bit now, although there still is that relationship. I'll give you just one recent example. Bahrainis about a year ago arrested and prosecuted a cell related to al-Qaeda. In the process of researching this monograph, Mike and I interviewed the prosecutors and the attorney general in Bahrain. Uh, the press here was very critical of the case because the individuals only got six months in jail. The prosecutors were very upset with that judgment, only under Bahraini law. Had they been acquitted, they could have appealed. Once convicted, they have no right to appeal the sentence. But the case is interesting because you had Bahraini and Qatari Sunni Islamists who were traveling to Iran where the Iranians were not stamping their travel documents as we believe was the case according to the 9-11 Commission with some of the 9-11 hijackers. 
and they were escorted across the large landmass of Iran. So they got to the Pakistan and the Fatah area, met up with people there. And in an interesting reversal, whereas al-Qaeda once upon a time would kick money out from the core to the periphery so that cells, whether it's for the millennial plots or others, could carry out attacks while they were planning their mega attacks. Now there's a sign that al-Qaeda core is under stress because it is asking for money from the periphery, from cells involved in crime, from al-Qaeda in Iraq, suggesting that it is under financial stress back in the core. Does this mean that Iran is part of al-Qaeda? Of course not. But the nature of the relationships, especially between the individuals, is extremely important. And the financial trail is an extremely effective way of mapping it. These relationships can take on all kinds of different uh, 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 looks. This is a great graphic that I stole from the Wall Street Journal, which has nothing to do with terrorism. It has to do with Iranian merchants evading sanctions, targeted financial measures on Iran. And we can talk about that in questions and answers if you like. But the point is here, again, relationships. Some of these relationships are family relationships. Some of them are business relationships. Not every link in a terrorist chain, or in this case a proliferation chain, is necessarily going to be illicit in and of itself, even as it may wittingly or unwittingly be serving an illicit purpose. An example of these types of relationships, one of the earliest ones is Bank Al-Taqwa. Uh, Al-Taqwa banking system was uh, designated very early on in November 01. And further investigation beyond the press statement that Treasury uh, released at the time revealed that there was also financial connections to Hamas, the Palestinian wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, to other Palestinian groups, North African groups, etc. Again, these types of relationships are uh, telling and uncovering them and figuring out what exactly they're all about uh, is critically important. It's also important to be able to figure out what the relationship is and where the line is to be drawn between operatives and supporters. You know, uh, pre-9-11, uh, one of the problems we had was that in, in Germany, it's still the case, prosecutors decide law enforcement priorities. Some of the individuals who were later identified as being tied to the 9-11 plot in one way or another were people who had been under surveillance in Germany, but prosecutors had determined, and this is not meant to be a shot at them, there were a lot of targets, that those guys weren't operatives but supporters and they moved surveillance elsewhere. Um, that type of thing happens all the time. And again, I'm not trying to stick my finger in, in the German eye here. You have to make these difficult decisions all the time. But sometimes the distinction between operatives and supporters is a very misleading one. Consider, for example, the case here in the Eastern District of New York, Cards on the Table. It's a case in which I testified as an expert witness and which was recently sent back by an appellate court because prosecutors apparently uh, went overboard in providing testimony of a particular Hamas attack that the defendants weren't accused specifically of being involved in that might have been prejudicial. So this will go back to a court. But in January 2003, uh, FBI and, and, and German law enforcement uh, conducted a sting, lured Sheikh Mayed from Yemen, where he had headed the Al-Aqsa International Foundation office there, which is tied to Hamas, uh, lured him to a hotel in Germany, which was wired every which way to Tuesday, and listened to him as he tried to tell uh, a cooperating witness, someone posing as an African-American convert to radical Islam who claimed he wanted to fund jihad, not Fatah, but Hamas, not, not uh, you know, the average Muslim, but uh, radical Islam. And I had told the informant about how he transferred $70,000 to the U.S.-designated Interpal tied to Hamas, and how he provided money to al-Qaeda, etc. And here you have a very good example. Hamas is not al-Qaeda, but we should not be surprised when radicals, especially tied to the radical elements of the Muslim Brotherhood, fund both. Again, reminded of my colleague and his experience with the uh, Hezbollah operatives, uh, the Hezbollah spokesman in, in Beirut. Don't expect these people to be carrying um, membership cards in their wallet. Having intelligence sources and resources that can help identify who's doing what and with whom is critical. This is a CSIS, Canadian Intelligence, surveillance photograph that was put into evidence in a trial in Charlotte, North Carolina, again, that I testified in as an expert witness of Hezbollah operatives in Canada procuring uh, false ID for a, a dual-use procurement ring that they were running up there, uh, which was tied to a fundraising cigarette smuggling scheme that was being run here in the U.S. from North Carolina to Michigan. But again, you know, these guys don't look like Hezbollah. Well, I don't know what Hezbollah guys are supposed to look like, but these guys look like three guys. I apologize, I know this is difficult to see, but it's the interconnectivity that's more important than the words. This is a graphic depiction of the facilitation of the Park Hotel suicide attack in Netanya 
in March 2002 uh, that led to the Israeli reinvasion of uh, the West Bank Operation Defensive Shield, um, an attack that killed uh, a whole bunch of Holocaust survivors. Um, what's interesting here is you have, uh, you know, the Hamas leadership abroad at the very top. You have the planners from two different cells in two different cities in the West Bank and the next level down. A series of facilitators who have a variety of contacts, uh, not with everybody, but with some people, eventually getting down to the driver and the person who actually ended up carrying out the attack, the bomber, and then the other bomber who got sick and therefore did not participate in the attack. Uh, again, just another way of thinking about the nature of the relationships between elements between in, within covert uh, groups and the value of any type of information that can help pull out these covert actors and see what they're doing, with whom are they doing it, how are they doing it, etc. So, you know, in short, to me, you know, an effective counterterrorism strategy is defined by, by two, putting two variables together. One is constricting the operating environment, making it more difficult to do all the things they need to do to carry out their operations, whether it's uh, get their hands on money or procure false documents, etc. And the second is engaging uh, more strategically uh, in a battle of ideas and counter-radicalization so that while we are making it more difficult for the people who are trying to do us harm today to succeed, we also make it more difficult for them to recruit the next generation of foot soldiers. To the extent we have uh, intelligence sources that can help us understand what people are doing so we can thwart it, that's great. To the extent we can deny them the resources they need to do what they want to do, that is also great. When we are thinking about uh, disrupting financial streams, to me, and this is now the second uh, uh, part of the, the terror finance agenda, not just following it for intelligence purposes, but actually disrupting, freezing, seizing uh, uh, terror finances, it has to be about focusing on keynodes uh, within this matrix of terror financing, constricting the environments to make it more difficult to do all these different things, as opposed to trying to seize as much money as possible, which I'll explain in a minute. One reason is that the people involved in a lot of these illicit activities, whether they're terrorist activities, proliferation activities, have a lot of overlap. There's no, you know, come and turn pullet bureau that's overseeing all this evil activity by some guy who's stroking a cat, you know, and, and you know, speaking in his evil voice. That said, it is the case that you'll sometimes see overlap between illicit actors, for example, who are going to the same uh, forging experts or money laundering experts, uh, especially, for example, when you see them overlapping in the organized crime world. So if you can focus on those keynotes, you can have an exponentially impactful uh, effort. And money laundering is critically important. We talk in our study a lot about money laundering because money laundering, or AML, has now been linked in with combating the financing of terrorism, AML-CFT. <laughs> To the extent we can put in effective anti-money laundering uh, standards and not just put them on paper, which is what's happening in many corners of the world, especially in the Middle East, but actually enforcing them, we can make it more difficult for people to do a variety of illicit financial activities. Um, and when it comes to terror finance, it's important to think about the three basic parts of money laundering, placement and layering and integration. To me, you know, if we only focus on the fundraising element of terror finance, it's kind of like a hamster in a cage. You're running and you're running and you're running and you're not getting very far. And the reason is that unfortunately, there are just too many ways, intentionally illicit or abuse of otherwise legitimate charity or business, too many ways to raise money ultimately for bad purposes. You will never, I hate the term, drain the swamp. That's why I think, again, if you focus on keynotes, the best place to focus within the best keynotes to focus on, that is, are on the layering, transferring, laundering, and integrating elements of the spectrum. Take it as I mean it, but I don't care if a terrorist group has lots of money in its accounts as long as they can't access them. I'd prefer, obviously, if they had little money in their accounts. But as long as they can't get the money where they need it to do what they need, that, too, is a success. <clears throat> And there's a lot of similarities between money laundering and terror financing, a lot of things that are different. We don't need to dwell on that. Of course, the ideological differences. The fact is, if we can walk and chew gum at the same time, if we can think about doing things on the terror finance side and doing things on, on the anti-money laundering side, whether or not people are doing things for the same ideological purposes doesn't make a difference, especially when we see that terror financiers 
even if they're not criminal money launderers, need to launder their money on their own or through others in the organized crime. And so we need to be thinking about this on both sides of the column. And there's a tremendous amount of potential, by the way, if you think about money laundering and you go back for one second to the financial side, to the kind of intelligence that isn't really intelligence. And what I mean by that is that it's not necessarily classified. If you think about following basic transactions and the type of information that is provided in a, in a basic correspondent account, this is the meat of the intelligence world. You know, the meat of the intelligence world is not what you see on 24. The meat of the intelligence world is full names, passport numbers, driver's licenses, bank account numbers that you might find in a report that has nothing to do with money. But then when you're searching to see if something you found about money makes any sense, you can go back to something from a year ago and, hey, wait a minute, we actually have that guy's driver's license. Or he has lists of different driver's license. And that is what it's all about. There's a lot that can be done, and I'll mention, I'll get back to this in a second later. It's critical absolutely critical to point out that the public actions that you read about and hear about most of the time in the public domain, designations by Treasury or State or by international organizations by, like the UN or other public statements by organizations like the Financial Action Task Force and arrests by the Department of Justice are only the most visible. They are not the sum total of our combating terror finance toolkit. Financial intelligence, diplomatic engagement and capacity building, regulatory enforcement, specific programs like, like a program that was put together with the lead of DHS to figure out where are cash couriers most active and trying to move cash in large sums across borders and then training those people to identify and prevent it. And I think perhaps one of the most interesting, maybe not particularly sexy, but perhaps one of the most promising areas is advances in public-private engagement. I've been pushing, for example, for a lot more attention to being able to provide some elements in the financial world, some level of clearance, even if it's just a secret collateral clearance, so that they can be better informed about what government is looking for, spend less money, and be more targeted, and provide back better information. DOD does this very well at a very large you know, large scale and has for many, many years providing clearances to people outside of DOD itself. This should not be reinventing the wheel. And you need to be thinking creatively because this is an evolutionary target. <clears throat> this is a target that will change quickly. We as bureaucracies do not turn on a dime. We do not move quickly. There are interagency equities. Treasury wants to designate. State Department is worried that it will have unintended diplomatic consequences. The intelligence community doesn't want to designate because they want to run an operation. Law enforcement wants to prosecute. The fact is our adversaries are on the Internet. They, they read Treasury's press releases, which include declassified information because there's a, a feel of the need to communicate to the public that you're not targeting, for example, Islamic charities for the sake of targeting Islamic charities, but because they're up, this particular charity, whatever it was, was up to no good. But they evolve quickly. And so, for example, we've seen uh, groups moving the decision-making um, uh, authority down from their headquarters offices to local offices and personnel, focusing on funding infrastructure, which requires a transfer of large sums of money, small parts of which easily can be uh, um, uh, shaved off the top. Uh, NGOs operating under new names you'll designate under this name today and they open up under a new name tomorrow. People using false names, instead of sending money to this uh, Hamas guy, the Hamas leaders in Damascus will send money to his wife's uh, hairdresser um, and, and that makes it much more difficult to trace. Um, so avoiding institutional accounts, spending a lot more time on public relations, for, for example, the infrastructure projects that they are working on through which they are siphoning off money as well and opening up in new arenas that we might not have been paying as much attention to. Just to give you one example of how our adversaries are really only limited by their creative ingenuity, let me be clear, there's no evidence that this actually happened. But this is one of 100, I think, 18 pages of telephone intercept summaries provided by Canadian intelligence and used in the uh, prosecution of this Hezbollah cell in Charlotte, North Carolina, at which I testified to my date, by the way, I believe it's the only case where Foreign Intelligence Service has declassified intelligence wiretaps for use in a public prosecution. And here in paragraph B, it talks about, according to the source, which is their way to hide that it's a telephone intercept, in the course of discussing life insurance, 
Mohamed Dabouk, who had been in Canada and since gone back to Lebanon, uh, had been trained by Iran and had gone out with his Al-Manar, Hezbollah satellite television, press credentials to uh, surveil Israeli uh, checkpoints in southern Lebanon before the Israeli withdrawal, provided that footage to Hezbollah. They planned operations, and then he would go out behind them and film the actual operation for use in, in fundraising propaganda videos. Dubuque refers to a person down there, meaning South Lebanon, who might in a short period of time go for a walk, a suicide attack, and never come back. I wondered if Saeed, a guy in Canada, could fix some papers and details. In other words, could they take out in Canada a life insurance policy in Canada for someone who's going to go carry out a suicide bombing in southern Lebanon? Presumably they'd falsify some documents so that it didn't say that he died by a suicide bombing and then collect that money. No evidence that happened. They also talked about counterfeit $100 bills. No evidence they used that. They used more basic credit card bust-out schemes, etc. But it shows that they are limited only by their creative ingenuity. So is this effective? And frankly, is it worthwhile? Banks will tell you they're spending way too much money on this. People will tell you terrorist attacks don't cost a lot of money. It's a game of cat and mouse. You designate this charity today. They open under another name tomorrow. There is this endless supply of funds. There are indeed costs to intelligence equities when you take public actions. How do you decide whether to follow the money or to freeze the funds? What are the costs to diplomacy, for example, if, if, if uh, much of the Arab and Muslim world believes, uh, and I'm not saying this is the case, but there are certain people who would argue this, that the United States just is anti-Muslim and is targeting as many Muslim charities as they can. Uh, and I would argue, by the way, therefore, what opportunities does this provide us in the battle of ideas, etc.? Is this worthwhile? I'd say the, the way you have to start here is in measuring the success of this most overt, the designation tool. Uh, and here, there are, is really no effective way of measuring its success. I've spent a lot of time since being Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence trying to think about ways to measure this. I'm not smart enough. I haven't come up with a, a good tool. What I can tell you is that the two tools that people tend to use are absolutely flawed. The first is how much money has been frozen. And that's flawed because, as I told you, I, I basically don't care. I remember one time we had a case, we designated um, accounts of, of a group of terrorist facilitators tied to Al-Qaeda. Uh, because they were tied to Al-Qaeda, they weren't Hamas, Hezbollah, we could designate them at the UN. At the UN you can only designate under 1267 elements tied to Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. But unfortunately the UN, when, uh, while you want to work multilaterally whenever possible, the UN leaks like a sieve. And so by the time the notification period ended, a lot of the money in accounts that had never ever moved in months and months and months was suddenly gone. We still freezed a decent amount of money, but several million dollars was lost. And I argue that it was still an incredibly effective uh, uh, action. Not only did we freeze a decent chunk of money, but it, we, we saw it was a keynote for a variety of illicit types of terrorist activity. So if all you're doing is trying to see how much money has been frozen, you're missing the point. Second, how many entities have been designated? Well, this presupposes that the best, maybe even the only, tool for dealing with terror finance, the necessary tool that you would take if you had information that someone or some entity was engaged in financing terrorism is that you would designate them, and therefore you add up the number of designations. But as I said at the outset, this is one tool, and it won't always be the right tool. And to knee-jerk do this every time is counterproductive. Use it when it is most effective. Again, it comes down to me uh, focusing on choke points. Not very, uh, um, uh, not, not a, not a very uh, satisfying answer for congressional overseers, but I don't answer to them anymore, so I'll just tell you how it is. Do the designations work? And here we're just focusing on the designations. I, I'd argue they do, because even though entities may open up under a new name tomorrow and there's a lot of money out there and it's cat and mouse, first of all, there is a name and shame element here. We have seen people who are involved in terror finance and they get outed and then all of a sudden they're no longer involved. Some of their friends aren't involved. Many times we're talking about financiers who have radical jihadist sympathies, but these are not the people who are sending their own sons or daughters to conduct suicide missions. They spent their lives building up financial empires that they don't want to put at risk. And so you can have, ironically, in this particular area, maybe arguably the only area in mod modern counterterrorism when you're dealing with people who literally are willing to blow themselves up, where you could have a deterrent effect. 
Second, as I said earlier, there is something to be said for doing what you can, when you can, to constrict the operating environment. In and of itself, will a designation prevent an act of terrorism? Not necessarily. Sometimes, maybe. We do have a few snippets here and there. But it does have a disruptive impact. It denies our adversaries the space and the time and the comfort and the funding to do what they want on their time and their leisure. It pushes them to use slower, less reliable funding and transfer mechanisms. And it offers us other opportunities including some I think people just haven't paid attention to, and I'll get to this at the end, on perhaps the battle of ideas. I think it's important to also note that the whole concept that, look, a terrorist attack, an effective terrorist attack, can be carried out for very, very little money, 9-11, for God's sakes, costs less than $500,000, misses the point. It's true. Any given terrorist attack requires very little money. But first of all, it requires money. And second of all, they need money for other things, too. Don't take Matt Levitt's word for it. What does he know? Listen to Mustafa Abu Yazid, uh, otherwise known as Sheikh Saeed. Sheikh Saeed was designated early on. He was one of Al-Qaeda's money man. He grew up uh, through all the Al-Qaeda ranks and is now believed to be one of the chief Al-Qaeda people in Afghanistan, um, tied to a variety of different plots. He uh, has been quoted uh, as saying uh, that he has people who are willing to go out and carry out suicide attacks. He just doesn't have the money to do it. Well, let me make it clear to you. A suicide attack doesn't cost a lot of money. That means that even a little bit of money, if unavailable, if they have it but they can't get it where they need it, can be an effective disruption strategy. Second of all, there's huge infrastructure costs, from bribing officials to traveling. Uh, in the case of groups like Hamas or Hezbollah, which buy grassroots support uh, through social welfare activity, social welfare activity that they use as a money laundering mechanism, it's extremely effective. And we've even seen global jihadist groups now engaging in this type of activity as well in places like Southeast Asia. As my former boss, Stuart Levy, had said, the cost of financing terrorist activity cannot be measured by the cost of a primitive destructive act. It's the maintenance of these networks that is expensive. My uh, book agent says I don't do enough uh, uh, self-promotion, so there it is. There's one of my books. But, uh, and if you're watching, there you go. Um, social welfare, as I mentioned, can cost a tremendous amount of money. I'll give you just a couple of examples in terms of Hamas. Uh, uh, providing support uh, to individuals who they were then able to use as part of their logistical network. So people who, in one case, people who received Hamas support uh, would be used as a boarding house to, to uh, hide fugitives. Uh, they provided a photocopier to a library in condition that the photocopier could be used to disseminate Hamas propaganda whenever they wanted. Uh, someone who drove a garbage truck was then approached to uh, be involved in a kidnapping attempt of an Israeli soldier, and that would soldier then be dumped in the back of the uh, of the garbage truck to get through to get through uh, checkpoints? The fact is, these types of tools have had an impact, uh, and while you rarely experience the Jack Bauer moment, there have been some declassified anecdotes. Uh, anecdotes related to the Hamas sanctions when the uh, Treasury Department designated the Al Salah Society in Gaza a year, year and a half ago. Uh, a unilateral action that could not be done at the UN because you can't designate Hamas at the UN. About two weeks later, the head of the Al-Salah Society held a news conference, hysterical, because he wasn't able to access any funds from Palestinian, Egyptian, or Jordanian banks who basically wouldn't touch him. Even a unilateral U.S. action because of the single integrated international financial system, because banks don't want to be caught you know, uh, uh, not doing all they can to protect themselves from reputational risk, due diligence, and fiduciary obligations to their shareholders, even they will take action when there's this type of, of, of an action. Most recently, when the Treasury designated the Union of Good, this umbrella organization funding uh, Hamas, and noted that Interpal in the UK is a key part of the Union of Good, a key uh, former head of Interpal is one of the chiefs of the Union of Good, just about a week later, uh, Lloyd's instructed the Islamic Bank of Britain to close the accounts of Interpal. You see the connection. Uh, FBI officials have, uh, have testified that following the money in this country has helped them thwart actual attacks abroad. Treasury officials have testified about seeing after actions that Treasury has taken, cells that have been targeted reporting that they lack the money they want to do the things they need to do. Perhaps the rare exception is the July 6 liquid bomb plot, where following the money, terror finance was one, not the only, let me be clear, but one of the key things that helped thwart what could have been an absolutely devastating uh, terrorist attack. Um, and uh, following the money in the UK in particular has been extremely successful. Scotland Yard has a national terrorist um, 
Financial Intelligence Unit, NTFIU, which has done phenomenal work. Uh, one of the cases they followed involved Diren Barot, otherwise known as Ismail Hindi. Back when all they knew was that there was a guy named Ismail Hindi, apparently a convert to Islam from Hinduism, who was plotting attacks trying to figure out who he was by following communications, following uh, uh, finances, including credit cards. Uh, they were able to identify him as Diren Barrow. Not only that, but then when they confiscated material, they found that he had written a several chapter long report for Al-Qaeda Corp. Here in chapter seven, circled in red, he talks about a plot to fill uh, limousines with uh, gas canisters that could then be uh, detonated in downtown London. If you want to do this cheap, he said, it's going to cost at least 60,000 pounds. If you want better operational security, we should not rent the flat where we're going to put this together, but we should buy it. That would cost more. 60,000 pounds already is a decent amount of money, certainly one that we are capable of tracking and tracing. I think that uh, Gordon Brown has put it well when he said, uh, comparing terror finance to Bletchley Park, that just as there be no safe haven for terrorists, there should be no hiding place for those who finance terrorism. The same way we had a focus on breaking the German code, we need to have a focus on breaking uh, the financial streams. Uh, here you have uh, one of my favorite cartoons. I was at Treasury when the New York Times did us all the disservice of uh, assuming that there was a brooch of, uh, of, of trust and insufficient protections when in fact there, there was no such uh, lacking, which the New York Times then uh, admitted in page 522, section Z, uh, a few weeks later. Um, the 9-11 Commission gave the only grade in the A range to the government's efforts to deal with terror finances, highlighting the financial intelligence side in A minus. This is exactly the type of program the government should be doing with not only, I wouldn't even say exactly the type of protections, but even more so. And Treasury came out with uh, public statements at the time, which were available on the internet, about the nature of the protections in this program, giving people 24-7 oversight. There was no data mining allowed. It was an unbelievable effort to make sure that people's uh, rights were protected. Uh, let me just conclude with this. You know, when it comes to the battle of ideas, which I argue is the area of counterterrorism where we are least proficient, we're pretty good at intelligence and kicking down doors and arresting people. Uh, but that's only dealing with the threat that, and the immediate threat people are trying to do us harm right now. We also need to, uh, to borrow the term I don't really love, drain the swamp of the next recruits. And I think this is someplace where we have not been as successful. If you think about the cycle of violence, if you can find a way to interrupt that cycle of violence, uh, dealing with someone's radicalization, and there are many, many ways a person gets radicalized and it has more to do with an individual's proclivities and personal history, access to an individual radicalizer, and that radicalizer's ability to put that individual's personal experiences into a global radical narrative. If we can interrupt this process, we can actually do some good in the battle of ideas. When it comes to terror finance, we have an opportunity. It's one of the few times the government declassifies sensitive intelligence, telling you what we're doing and why. There should be no reason for people to think that the United States is targeting Islamic charities because we hate Muslims. Quite the opposite. We've got a lot of open source information now made public to explain what and why we've done. And I'll give you just one example. After the July um, 06 war between Israel and Hezbollah, an interesting parallel to think about now with what's going on in Gaza, uh, we came across information that Jihad al binna Construction Jihad, Hezbollah's construction company, was engaging in the same type of deceptive financial practices that Iran engages in, seeking funding from international development organizations, but hiding the fact that it was part of Hezbollah and very close to Iran. Um, we also found out that it was doing a whole bunch of other things uh, on behalf of Hezbollah, as most of these terrorist entities do, never just dealing with social welfare or charity or construction, but also a little bit of other things too. And there was a big debate, should it be designated or should it not? Um, I argued that it should. Others argued that it should not. And in the end, it was designated. And the argument against designating it was, gosh, uh, the international perception is going to be that the United States blindly backed Israel in this war, Israel destroyed this infrastructure, and now we won't even let Lebanon reconstruct. And what I and others argued is, look, uh, the United States actually pledged and in fact gave more international assistance to Lebanon, military and reconstruction, than the rest of the international community combined. UN, bilateral, not even close. Why aren't we striking a balance in our public statement between what we're doing, 
tell people why we're doing it. It's not because we don't like Hezbollah. Here's what they were doing. Oh, and by the way, we're absolutely supportive of Iran, of uh, Lebanon reconstructing. We just won't let Iran and Hezbollah drag both parties, Lebanon and Israel, into this war and then gain credit and build grassroots support for rebuilding uh, what they're doing. Especially when we then believed, and there's been a lot of open source analysis about this too, that Jihad al-Binna was building bunkers under the apartment buildings they were building and all kinds of other things too. Some future trends and, and that'll be it. You know, as I said, there's been a lot of evolutionary change. We do see crossover between groups between, at the financial and logistical support level. So again, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, not the same thing, but you will find huge overlap between the logistical and financial support networks operating internationally uh, including Hamas people and Al-Qaeda people. We've seen that in several cases here in the United States. For example, the International uh, African Relief Agency and others uh, that have been publicly tied to financing both Hamas and Al-Qaeda. Uh, other future trends to look out for are the future of Iraq and other flashpoints. It doesn't make a difference whether we should have gotten into that war or not, whether what the Israelis are doing now in Gaza is good or not. The fact is <clears throat> that if we don't engage in the battle of ideas, on top of our tactical issues, these conflicts, these flashpoints do serve as radicalization and financial uh, support uh, bases for, for our adversaries, and that's something we need to contend with. If things go better in Iraq, it'll be harder for people to raise money. And in fact, one of the areas we believe uh, Al-Qaeda is getting a lot of money is Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Don't forget the uh, Zawahiri letter to Zarqawi saying, look, we're having a hard time. Can you, spend, uh, can you spare $100,000? Uh, the relationship between Al-Qaeda core and the periphery. As I mentioned, we now have instances where the Al-Qaeda periphery is providing money to the core. Is the core still in charge of the periphery? Is there now a disaggregation? Is it a true franchising now? Where Al-Qaeda has created these monsters and lets them run, or is Al-Qaeda still trying to maintain control over them? This makes a difference. And the, you know, where we come out uh, in, the, in the debate between Al-Qaeda core uh, being functional today, which I believe it is, or it being really a leaderless bunch of guys, which if Bruce were here, he'd have a thing or two to say about, and I would, uh, I would concur with him. And finally, you know, in the age of, of you know, non-state actors, state sponsorship of terrorism is still critically important. We see that right now in terms of what's going on in Gaza. There are reports, for example, that not only was Hamas uh, receiving significant funds uh, and weapons from Iran, but that those weapons were, were uh, made special. For example, grad rockets that were re-engineered to be able to unscrew into three pieces to better make it through the sharp turns in the Rafah smuggling tunnels. And, of course, uh, proliferation finance. Transition themes for a new administration, I think, are, uh, just to review some of the things I've said, when it comes to combating the financing of terrorism, I think that there's a lot more that can be done to leverage what we're already doing uh, in the battle of ideas and strategic communication. As DAS for Intel, one of my jobs was working with the intelligence community to get sufficient information declassified for use in a public statement, but without putting sources and methods at, at risk, which was not an easy thing to do. Once we go to these lengths, to declassify information, which is a painful and, and risky process, it drives me bonkers when we don't do everything possible to make the best possible use of that information. I think that whenever you have a new administration, there'll be some talk about the bureaucratic structure of the interagency. I think, actually, the bureaucratic structure of the interagency on combating terror finance is effective, and I would argue that it should be at least largely kept. Again, I think there has to be a much, much greater focus on ways to enable the private sector to, uh, to, to be helpful in a way that won't be as costly to them and may even be uh, more effective for uh, government. There is, uh, uh, I think, a need to focus significantly on Iran. Uh, Iran is believed to provide as much as $200 million a year to Hezbollah alone with supplementals, if you'll excuse the, uh, uh, the my government bureaucratic experience coming out uh, in, in instances like after the July 2006 war. Uh, Iran's ability to create havoc in areas that make it difficult for us, not only on terror finance, but on peace process and other issues is significant. Uh, obviously, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other flashpoints. Um, and finally, I think there needs to be an effort to revisit the structure, process, and utility of multilateral designations. You've probably heard about the international court challenges to multilateral designations in the EU and the UN. I think the silver lining to those challenges is that I think they, these processes do need to have more uh, um, uh, transparency. Uh, there does, does need to be a better clarity of the rule of law, how people can get on and off the lists. 
even as you protect sources and methods, and I think that's an opportunity we should embrace. Um, and with that, I will thank you again for uh, having me and thank you all for coming and open it up to whatever questions you may have. Thank you, Matt. Can I just lead off? We're in the middle of an, a global economic crisis. Um, how is, is that term, you know, kind of roiling financial markets and, and the global economy, is that, does that affect any of the things that you've been talking about here? Absolutely not. Of course, in, in, in many, many ways. Um, first of all, I think uh, in terms of getting uh, cooperation from governments in the private sector, there's going to be a uh, tension that I think we're already seeing between the fact that there are so few profit-making opportunities that people are going to be uh, drawn like bugs to light to those few remaining opportunities to have a profit margin. Some of those profit margins, whether it's in Iran, oil and gas, or whatever, may be areas where, where we don't think people should be investing, um, and uh, that may be a problem. The flip side is that it may kick the other way, and I think we're seeing that also, too. It's really case by case, and that is uh, the, the international financial crisis has highlighted uh, the issue of risk, financial risk security risk, and I think that uh, the, the tension within financial institutions between the people who are trying to make a profit and the people who are trying to protect against reputational and litigation risk is probably uh, uh, more pronounced even than it was beforehand. And for my friends in the private sector, it's tell me it's, it's always been quite pronounced. Um, there's a lot of, lot of activity going on. And so there really is a needle in a haystack issue of being able to pull the right uh, things out of, 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 of the system. Um, with everything that's going on, I don't know if it becomes more or less difficult. Um, but there certainly is more attention to what's going on. And I think that that may, whether in fact it is the case that it makes the activities of illicit financial actors uh, more susceptible to um, being stumbled upon by regulatory or law enforcement officials. That may be the case, but even if it's not, uh, I venture to guess that there are a lot of illicit actors out there that are afraid that that is the case. Um, and we'll have to see how that bears out. And the final thing is, you know, if, uh, if it's not a uh, great profit to keep your money in some areas, who knows, maybe the same way you, know, you and I have probably mm -hmm. moved around where we keep our money. I have a thicker mattress. Um, the, the, our adversaries are likely doing the same, and, and if it's you know, going back to uh, you know, cash and cash couriers, there are some advantages to us. That's slower. It's less reliable. Um, you know, Jamal Al-Fadl and many others after him uh, you know, decided maybe, yeah, will, they, will they really miss a few thousand dollars if I take it? On the other hand, it, it, you can't track it through the formal financial system. Okay, let's open it up now for comments and questions. If speakers could please identify themselves and speak up, just given the acoustics in this room. Yes, ma'am. That's an excellent question. It's the one I was alluding to at the end when I was saying that there are opportunities, especially in terms of the multilateral designations, and making them uh, all that much clearer in terms of not only how people get on the list, but how to get off the list. Uh, the, the, the case of the uh, Barakat remittances is perhaps the most pronounced, um, and it's one that's been longstanding. There, there are sometimes is just going to end up at the end of the day be a, a, 
maybe even an insurmountable delta between the desire to make more information public and the ability to uh, declassify intelligence. Sometimes it won't be even an intelligence issue. It'll be an issue of the, the information may come from uh, foreign government, and then there are all kinds of third-party rules in terms of what you can and cannot make public that is someone else's information. <clears throat> but I, I do know uh, that there is uh, a, a very serious focus on trying to make this more transparent, which is not really what you asked, but I think is, is the underlying issue, is that it's, it's the fact that you're asking and the others have asked, uh, and it's very legitimate, suggests that it's just not transparent enough. Because yes, there are means of getting off the list. Uh, people have been taken off both the UN list and the US list. Some of the things that needed to be fixed and are being fixed now, for example, are the fact that if you wanted to get off the UN list, then the entity that, that nominated you, the, the country had to be the one to nominate you off. Um, and so that sometimes gets into diplomatic issues and end up, could end up having nothing to do with you, but rather, you know, there's tensions between the U.S. and Russia over Georgia, and so one of the two isn't playing nicely with the other over the, this, uh, this diplomatic issue. Uh, and that is not an infre infrequent issue, not necessarily between those countries, but in general. I think that this is an incredibly important tool. To the extent that the public lacks faith in it, though, it will not be as effective. I think it would still be somewhat effective, but it will not be as effective. And so I think uh, that it's incredibly important and applaud the efforts, both within Treasury for the U.S. unilateral program and internationally with what Treasury and State Department are doing to push this at the U.N. to make this more transparent. We have a microphone in the back. We'll come this gentleman here. I'm Rafi Danziger. Hi, Matt. Uh, Matt, you mentioned that Iran is financing Hamas uh, in Gaza. I know that you recently engaged in a debate with another former U.S. official on this issue, and she claimed that there is no evidence of such financing. Could you lay out for us some of the evidence that you have that actually Iran is financing Hamas? Well, in a nutshell, uh, what was frustrating about that interview was, you know, I thought that the person I was uh, in this point-counterpoint discussion going to say was, well, sure, Iran funds Hamas, but Iran has a calculation and offer the right incentives, uh, carrots and sticks perhaps, but certainly carrots, Iran could be convinced to change uh, that behavior. Uh, I might not agree with her on her analysis there either, but uh, to me it was shocking that a person would say that Iran doesn't fund Hamas, because the U.S. government has provided a lot of information, the Canadians, the Europeans, the Israelis have seized documents, uh, we, we have, you know, rockets that have the, uh, n the, uh, uh, the, the, the numbers on them from Iranian stockpiles. Um, there just is no debate about whether or not Iran funds Hamas. The question is uh, what to do about it. You, they're, they're really three things. One is following for intelligence purposes, this, which has been done. Some of that's been made public, which is why it was so strange as he said that. The second is disruption. And there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, but right now it comes down to focusing, A, on the smuggling tunnels in Rafah, and B, on the longstanding smuggling, arm smuggling routes that cut across Yemen and into uh, East Africa and up through Sudan and Egypt. Um, and uh, uh, Trying to have a, trying to have an impact that way, um, you know, the the monograph has at the end of it, by the way, three case studies on kind of where are we in terror financing in three different groups, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, and Hamas, including an updated section on Hamas and government, some of the ways Hamas has been able to fund itself uh, as the uh, de facto governing entity uh, in Gaza, and so kind of the latest information there uh, is 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 in the report. Come in here. Just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Hirsch. I'm a freelance journalist here in town. Um, I was interested in this, this 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 notion that you brought up when you when you cover this. You frequently hear people say, as you mentioned, that uh, terrorism is different than other activities. It doesn't cost a lot of money. And then, as as you and Stuart Levy have said, well, maybe maybe not because of other costs, and that's borne out if you read the accounts of jihad training camps and so forth and, and what they cost. My question to you, though, is uh, the argument that terrorism is a less expensive activity than, say, drug smuggling or money laundering is often used to, to say that the current U.S. regulations uh, are uh, badly, uh, are ill-suited to this activity. My question to you is if 
if if this is not as inexpensive an activity as people say, do the uh, are the regulations that we have in place now adequate, or should they be changed? That's an excellent question, one that really can't be answered on one foot. There's a lot to be said about regulations, and again, for specifics, I'll refer you to the report where we have a large recommendation section, including a whole host of recommendations on existing regulations uh, and a whole bunch of other things, some of which my former colleagues at Treasury agree with, I think most, a few they don't. Uh, Mike and I briefed this uh, at Treasury and State and IMF and intelligence community and elsewhere and got a whole bunch of interesting, mostly almost entirely positive feedback. But uh, uh, it's interesting. Sometimes one department would agree with some of these recommendations and another wouldn't, which suggests, you know, just their equities where they come from. But more generally, you know, there's two issues. One is I do believe there are significant costs. And significant doesn't have to be in the millions. If you think about the Durham Barrowed issue, you know, 60,000 pounds is a not insignificant amount of money if you can deny them that much money. Arguably, if you can even deny them enough of it, it doesn't have to be all 60,000, so they can't carry out that plot, success. Like I said, Treasury officials have testified about cases in Southeast Asia where, where people have talked about this. Gosh, we were ready to do something, now we don't have the money to do it. We've seen this in the context of Hamas as well. And, and, and even if it doesn't cost a lot of money, if you can prevent them from getting the little money they need, as we apparently, and by the way, sometimes it's intentional, probably a lot of the time you, you take actions and there are unintended consequences for good and for bad. I imagine that in the case of Mustafa Abu Yazid, not having enough money for a suicide bomber, it's probably something that wasn't a targeted action. Who knows, maybe it was, but it could have been something that you know, just happened because the various things we're doing. Uh, it can be effective. And to the extent you can put you know, a structure in place <clears throat> that through targeted financial measures actively, proactively targets them, and then have kind of defensive measures in place through anti-money laundering um, activities, uh, through use of uh, Section 311, smart use of Section 311 of the Patriot Act, which is, by the way, not an offensive tool. It's a defensive tool. You know, Treasury or any financial uh, finance ministry has an obligation to prevent bad guys from being able to do bad things with money and to protect, in our case, the U.S. financial system from abuse. Section 311 basically just says that if you are perceived to be, if you are deemed to be a prominent money launderer or terror financier, and you don't stop that activity, we're going to prevent you from doing business in the U.S. For those of you who have children, think of it as your kid asks to bring a friend home and that kid has you know, pneumonia. You're not going to let the kid into the house until the kid's better. Been on antibiotics for 24 hours. So you're not going to let those types of actors into the United States where they could infect and do bad things to our, to our economy. Smart use of these tools can go a very, very long way. And just to pick up on one thing that wasn't in your question but made me think of something, and we talk about it in the study at, at some length, um, the connection between terrorism and, and drugs in particular and crime in general is sharply increased. And the opportunities are tremendous. There is no more profitable criminal activity than, crime, than drugs, and not just the production. There's the whole cycle, the protection rackets, et cetera. Um, and the U.N. estimates, I think it's over $300 billion a year. I forget the numbers are in the study. Um, a, a tremendous amount of interconnectivity to the point that the Drug Enforcement Administration now talks about these narco-terrorists that they see as some of the most dangerous people out there in terms of what they are doing violently, the most violent. And it's a little bit scary because I'm not, you know, forgiving the terrorists what they do, but at least you can understand a little bit because it's based on some grand ideology. And so the inhumane activities they carried out, you can kind of figure out that they've decided that the value of their ideology goes above and beyond those otherwise basic human instincts. Some of these people we're talking about in the drug connection, they have no ideology. It's just profit, and they're willing to do the most heinous and violent things, and it's not for ideology, it's that much more difficult to, to wrap your head around. If, if, if you were asked, would you push the new administration to make any changes in this area? Yeah, and I'll refer you to the monograph so that I get them right. Okay. Um, yes, uh, the gentleman there, and then Stephanie Kaplan here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your comments today. I, I guess uh, a lot Can of identify yourself, please. Uh, J. R. Helmig, uh, Spadak. Um, a lot of your comments uh, today deal with, and in most of our administration, any finite focus is based on the money system as an enabler, mm -hmm. and not as a target. 
And a lot of times when we talk about financial worlds being a target, people think back to the bricks and mortar, you know, the New York uh, arena, how can we attack the bricks and mortar structure? But one only has to look at, say, the Mizuho trading incident where somebody made a clerical error and it cost $350 million or long-term capital management, Barings Bank, et cetera. Um, you know, it seems like we're focusing on the, the enabling part of it versus the fact that it can be used in a financial target component uh, to the exclusion of that second aspect. You know, it's almost like the draining the swamp going after the cash type monies instead of the other type monies. Uh, you know, when cash makes up such a small subset of the, uh, the total global money system. Uh, do you see any changes? Do you see a, is it just a lack of awareness on that part? Yeah. Um, I would, I would contest, I think, the premise of the question. And that is to say that these are not in any way mutually exclusive. And you're right, my lecture here is on this as an enabler issue. The uh, target side of it is dealt by a whole different side of government. It's the people who deal with critical infrastructure protection, primarily at DHS, though there is an element to Treasury that deals with this too, and has primary lead, I believe, still on uh, the financial uh, sector. Um, there are lots of cases, in case, indeed, the, the case of Darren Barrow. Darren Barrow was one of the people involved in the plot that was uh, revealed to have uh, surveilled uh, the U.S. Uh, financial institutions in, in New York and New Jersey. Um, so it, I, I, it's a critically important issue. It's one that gets a lot of attention. Uh, it's just a, 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 a not unrelated, but a different component of things. It's a more of a homeland security, critical infrastructure protection question, uh, as opposed to uh, stopping uh, the actors from having the money to do that or other types of attacks, or following it to be able to pick up on those types of attacks. And that's really where the two meet. So I agree with the question in the sense that these are critically important and would contest the premise, if, if I understood it correctly, that the government is focusing on uh, terror finance uh, as an enabler to the exclusion of, of uh, it as a target. Um, I think the government is actually very focused on both, and, and thank you for, for raising it. Stephanie Kaplan. Hi, uh, Stephanie Kaplan, MIT and Wilson Center. Um, thanks for your talk. It's terrific in the report as well. Uh, my question is actually um, refers to um, how armed conflicts change um, the terror finance landscape. So how does it change, how does the presence of a war change both the money available and the types of ch channels through which it it flows? Does it increase the pie? Does it um, divert it? You mentioned, you alluded to that a little bit. And then how does it change? Um, the, on the other side, how, does, how do we track flows that go into and out of war zones? Now, there, might, there are parts of the answer to that question that I probably can't answer um, uh, and shouldn't answer. <clears throat> there is no question that uh, in different types of uh, environments, uh, you will s often see different types of activity, whether it's financial activity or, or otherwise. One of the evolutions, one of the reasons we see so much evolutionary change within this area is because often it's, it's uh, targets of opportunity. And when you have the chaos of war or other types of ongoing conflict, that provides often uh, different types of, of opportunities because of the chaos. Consider, for example, uh, the New York Times covered this. Uh, there was apparently a U.S. intelligence community assessment of funding for the war in Iraq, uh, the, the, the insurgency uh, in Iraq, to include kind of the, uh, the AQI, al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the Ba'athists all. And what I'm saying now is just based on this New York Times coverage of it. Um, according to that uh, report, some 70 or 75 percent of the insurgency was believed to be funded by criminal activity. Uh, kidnappings and uh, uh, diverting oil and uh, fraudulent charity and all kinds of crime, uh, counterfeit issues, etc. Which is not to say that there was still not a decent amount of money coming in from the outside. And one of the things that a lot of people were concerned about at the time was the uh, kind of worst case scenario from an illicit finance perspective of a surplus, where you have a war that's being so well funded from the bad guy's side, uh, and you have people who are involved in that conflict who, who did, in fact, uh, under Zarqawi, uh, express an interest in expanding and conducting attacks abroad. Think just about the attacks in uh, Amman or the attacks in Aqaba. They had talked about attacks in Europe 
and the homeland here as well. Um, imagine if they had surplus funds and then were able to use them for some of those types of things. Um, on the flip side, uh, once you had U.S. forces on the ground in Iraq, you had U.S. forces on the ground in Iraq. And you had much better oversight and insight into what's going on, for example, at the border crossings and at different places. And if there was a concern, you could send forces there. Um, you could, as has been reported in the press, you know, start up a uh, uh, um, uh, project uh, in Iraq, an interagency project focus on, focused on, on money and stopping the money, uh, Iraq Threat Finance Cell, um, which was overseen by Treasury and CENTCOM uh, with other interagency participation to get some better insight and do some uh, better tactical things on the ground to, to deal with this problem. And I think that it actually has been very, very successful. So maybe that's the one example I can give you. Um, gentleman back there. Uh, Henry Hedger, researcher at NARA. Retired government. I, I thought I'd ask you about something I read in the papers a couple days ago. Uh, a trail has been uncovered of, of the sale of sensors to Malaysia and then on to Iran, uh, which are used in roadside bombs, uh, apparently part of the paraphernalia to set them off. I wondered, is the money trail responsible for this being uncovered, or is there something else behind it? I don't know the specific... Uh I, I don't know the specifics of what, what led to the uncovering of this case, and if I did, I wouldn't say publicly. Um, but uh, following money is frequently one of the tools that will help uncover this type of activity, not the only one. And again, another good plug for an all elements of national power focus, including all elements of, of intelligence collection. This is only one stream of intelligence collection. What it does highlight is not only how proactive, and I, I would even argue aggressive, Iran is uh, in support of its various illicit activities, um, but also how proficient it is, and therefore uh, one would correctly assume how proficient some of its proxies are at uh, engaging in this type of activity through uh, front organizations, um, especially in the proliferation front. And uh, you know, the other piece of the news this week was now another major fine against an international bank, Lloyd's, for um, participating in one of Iran's kind of traditional deceptive financial practices. Whereas, you know, you might be the best compliance office in the world, and you look at a, a, the, the printout of a swift transaction, an international transaction, and instead of saying, you know, Iran and something tied to the military industrial complex, it'll say, you know, that this is a transaction between a telecommunications company in Turkey and a supplier in Cyprus or something. Literally, just uh, you know, something more slightly sophisticated than whiteout. And then you, as the compliance officer, there's no way to dig deeper in that without intelligence. Uh, and banks would sometimes agree to this so that they could hide the Iranian footprint, so that they could engage and facilitate the Iranian business, thinking that it wouldn't cost them this risk. Uh, there have been other cases. ABN AMRO was uh, the other the other big one, um, and I think that this too has an extremely effective deterrent impact on Iran on, on private sector entities' willingness to in participate in this type of illicit conduct. I'm going to take two more questions, Rich Fryman, and then the gentleman over there. Yes, Rich Fryman from the Wilson Center. Thank you for the fascinating presentation. I was wondering if you'd comment a little bit more on the use of name and shame as a tool. And what I'd be interested in is the relative effectiveness of name and shame dealing with state and non-state actors, and then also whether uh, name and shame is the accurate characterization, or is it more name and, sh and sanction? Thank you. Can I just uh, build on that question, because it's a theme that's come up in a number of our meetings, also in the non-proliferation sector. Uh, there were sanctions on the Macau Bank that was uh, laundering some of the North Korean money that was tied to criminal activities. And in the, the terrorism field, there's sort of a lot of uh, hand-wringing and, oh, my God, they're non-state actors and we don't have any leverage on non-state actors. But these non-state actors, they don't exist in some Cartesian space outside this universe. They are in states, and we have a lot of leverage of the kind you've described uh, to um, uh, affect institutions that have state, state control. I mean, it seems that, that 
they can get us quite a ways there. Not all the way there, but, but there's a lot of leverage we can gain from it. Right, excellent questions. Uh, thank you for them both. I, I would say that it really is name and shame, and what we're saying is as a corollary to the sanction. In other words, it is the sanction that is naming and shaming them. One thing that people might ask is, would you ever want to sanction just for the purpose of naming and shaming? And I think that that would probably be pretty rare. I imagine there could be some cases. And the important thing to mention there is that even if, when asking what am I trying to accomplish, which is a mantra I'm always telling people, I said it when I was in government, and I say it to people in government when I'm out of government, make sure you're asking yourself, not just, hey, I can use this tool, but what are you trying to accomplish by using this particular tool? Because then you might actually determine if it's the right tool, which is going to be part of the answer to your question in a minute. Um, but you, you, you have the, uh, the, the, the foundation for the reason for taking the action. It's never going to be, gosh, it would be great if we could hit that target for naming and shame person, let's sanction it. You still have to hit threshold, whether it's through intelligence or other things. You have to demonstrate that it is engaging in the type of illicit conduct that fits the threshold for the tool you want to use, whether it's an executive order for proliferation or, counter ter or, or terror finance or what have you. Um, I think the naming and shaming, when it comes to this, is likely going to be effective, or most effective anyway, in that thin, relatively thin slice of the pie of major donors. The good news, well, it's not good news that major donors are still a major problem of terror finance, but the good news is that since major donors are still a problem. This thin slice is not quite so thin, and there is, there are opportunities to leverage it effectively. And so, you know, uh, there are several cases of major donors, especially in the Gulf, but not only, uh, who did not want to put their financial empires at risk, and once exposed, have spent all their time and excess money not financing terrorism, but fighting in the courts and through the various opportunities there are to fight in the courts, and some of them are very angry because they have this opportunity, but they haven't won, which is another question. Um, now, could you target some of these non-state actors through the states in which they are resident? Well, that depends. If the state in which they're resident is believed to be complicit or tolerating, then you might have a platform. But do you really want to start targeting states for activity that's going on within their border that they don't know about or that they're un for some reason unable to do. Terror financing happens in the United States. And I mean, we do something about it, but by definition, we don't know about it, in it at its inception. We find out about it, we stop it. But uh, the only time you could do it is if you believe the state is complicit, which basically comes down to some form of facilitation or sponsorship. And I put it that way because state sponsorship obviously has the technical legal definition. The action that was taken against Banco Delta Asia, BDA, in the North Korean context is a very interesting one. You could, we could do a whole lecture on that, come back another time. The point is that it's interesting how incredibly, I would argue, much more effective, uh, how effective it was, I would argue, more effective than people might have thought at the time because it was focused on a keynote, because we got the right 24 million, not because it was 24 million, which in the scope of things from North Korea in terms of their program is not so huge. There has been, however, a real concern about using Section 311 in the counterterrorism context, and it's been used very, very sparingly in that context. I think the last time it was used was in a case along uh, the lines that you're suggesting, targeting the Commercial Bank of Syria in Syria. Uh, the Treasury Department notified of its intent to possibly uh, uh, designate or list the Commercial Bank of Syria, CBS, as a primary money launderer and sanction it or keep it out of the U.S. financial system under Section 311, uh, and gave it an opportunity to change. Uh, CBS did change some of its stuff, but nowhere near enough. Uh, Treasury came out and said, look, here's what you did. Here's why it wasn't enough. We're going, we are what's called going final, and they finalized uh, that sanction. There hasn't been one, to my knowledge, since. In fact, Section 311 has only been used maybe 10 or 12 times total. And one of the reasons is that it is, again, it's a defensive tactic. It, you don't want to use it as an offensive tactic. Um, it, it's supposed to be a technocratic means of protecting the U.S. financial system from abuse. And people are afraid of using it in an environment that might be perceived by some and be difficult to defend by others as being 
uh, kind of very cut and dry, technocratic, and, and what might be perceived as some as being a political issue. So, for example, you'll notice that Section 311 has never been used in the context of Iran, whereas Iranian banks absolutely fit as a potential 311 target. But I think there was a very, very smart uh, calculation uh, thinking, okay, we have various tools at our disposal, a variety of executive orders, Section 311, lots of things we can do. How do we want to use them best? And I'll just conclude by saying I'm being slightly disingenuous, and that is to say Section 311 has never been imposed on any Iranian entity, but Section 311 is the very foundation of the informal effort that the Treasury and State Department have, have done, reaching out to the financial sector directly and saying, look, there is a risk to continuing risky behavior. Here's what Iran is up to, nine-digit line item in its budget to support terrorism, no functioning anti-money laundering or combating terror financing elements, four FATF regulations saying be careful because you can't know where their money is going, they're engaging in deceptive financial practices. Since once this is all laid out, what kind of confidence can you possibly have that the investment or the loan guarantees or the lines of credit that you're providing aren't also being used and abused for other illicit conduct? And the answer, of course, is they can't by definition. And so then the pitch is, you know, well, then maybe you shouldn't be doing that kind of business. And by the way, if you continue to do that kind of business, despite the fact that we've had this conversation and we've told you and you now know, you can't say you don't know, uh, it could get to the point where you are seen as such a risky actor, you're facilitating so much illicit business, you could put your business in the United States at risk. And many people see that as, oh, okay, that's a defensive action. And others see that, that there's an implicit threat. I see it as kind of telling my son, don't do that bad thing. And if you do, there will be a consequence. It's kind of both. Just about out of time, but one last question to this gentleman here. Alan Goldie, retired diplomat. I was struck by your use of the phrase uh, endless supply of funds for the bad guys. It seemed to me uh, uncharacteristically, if I may say so, defeatist uh, when compared with the uh, brilliant account you've been giving us of the interdiction and intelligence gathering uh, from the movement of funds. You also spoke, but without giving detail, about the battle of ideas. Can I ask you to send us away with some positive thoughts on how the latter might help uh, addressing the former analysis? You, sir, should consider coming out of retirement. That's an excellent <laughs> diplomatic segue. Thank you for the question. Let me be clear. I'm just trying to be um, uh, painfully honest with you. And that is not at any level to sound defeatist. And I think the overall juxt uh, gist of the presentation makes it very clear. I think this is an incredibly powerful, incredibly effective tool. I think it's one that, to answer a question I posed at the outset, is going to be firmly embraced by the incoming administration with improvements, I would say, not so much even changes, but improvements at the margins. Um, but I don't think it's defeatist to admit that if one were to focus one's resources on the raising of money, one would find oneself in a very frustrating position. There's just too many ways that money can be raised from the get-go for illicit purposes or then under the pre pretext of legitimate charitable or other activity that can be diverted for illicit activity that you will never drain the swamp. And therefore, that shouldn't be our goal. It doesn't mean we can't be effective otherwise. There is so Think about the war on drugs. There are just so many ways so many ways to engage in this type of illicit activity. My pitch has always been, and my instructions to my analysts in the past has been, don't get me wrong, I'll be thrilled if we seize a decent chunk of terrorist money. Um, if we can, that, that's, that's great. But let that not be the premise by which we judge ourselves. Because the, the, the kicker has to be preventing them from having access to their money. And if the place where we can have the biggest exponential impact is at the laundering, transferring, layering, accessing points of the spectrum, so be it. Let's, let's, let's play on that Achilles heel of our adversaries. So it's not meant to be defeatist at all. Let's target that too. And I think we've targeted that with some great success. But I think that that isn't the uh, measurement by which we should hold ourselves accountable in this area. In terms of the battle of ideas, I, I, go by, I, I did have the Jihad al-Binna example for you, but 
you know, there has been improvement here. Uh, it was relatively controversial. Um, I supported it. But uh, a while back, there was a very large tranche, to use government terminology, of designations targeting Iran, some for proliferation and some for terrorism, including the IRGC Quds Force. That was the first really organized, strategic, public diplomacy rollout campaign I saw for these types of actions. When you go back to that example I gave of Jihad al binna the actual designation happened shortly after I left government. And I venture that if you went online this afternoon and Googled Jihad al binna there'd be a few more things between now and then. But if you look at the period right after the designation, the only things you'd find are the Treasury press release, the Treasury press release on a few uh, embassy websites, a piece that I wrote, and my appearance in Al Jazeera to debate somebody on the subject. Nothing else. No senior U.S. officials on major media. No op-eds, no big lectures, no nothing. You look later on after the, the Quds Force designation and you see a very, very different picture. I think that we have turned a corner in the realization of the import of this area, even though I argue that we are still turning on how effectively we do these things. I happen to think that Undersecretary under Glassman has uh, made marked improvement in this area. And it's my understanding the cooperation between state and DOD and the intelligence community, in particular and CTC on these things, is uh, frankly seamless. Um, I don't know how institutionalized it is or how personality driven, with your experience I'm sure you know that it's often uh, the latter unfortunately, uh, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens as a new team comes in. But this is an area where I see significant improvement even as I see it as an area where the incoming administration could make more improvements still. Thank you. Before concluding, just an announcement or two. First, uh, we're always updating our mailing list and uh, people's coordinates change. So uh, please, uh, if you have a card, leave it in, in the basket and we'll, so we have your most up-to-date information. Um, upcoming events, January 23rd. Um, all of these events are in the noon hour in this room. January 23rd, we have uh, William Toby, who's the outgoing uh, senior administrator in the National Nuclear Security Administration of DOE. He's going to be talking about nuclear proliferation and terrorism. That's Friday, January 23rd. February 10th, we have the uh, Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Patrick Walsh, coming in to talk about uh, U.S. maritime strategy, but he's been very involved also in uh, war on terrorism, and I think that, that, that we can get into a broader set of issues than just uh, uh, maritime strategy. February 18th, uh, noon in this room, uh, David Sanger, who is a former public policy scholar of the New York Times, of course, will be giving a presentation on his book, which has been all over the press. Uh, two days later, February 20th, former uh, head of the Iraq survey group, Charles Dolfer, who was also a public policy scholar, here is going to be talking uh, about his new book on the Iraq uh, in, in inspection, uh, the, the WMD uh, search post uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein. So uh, please, uh, as, uh, as you're interested, mark those dates down and join us for those meetings. In the meantime, please uh, thank, uh, join me in thanking Matt Levitt for an